frequently promote acquisitions as a means of growing enterprise value or multiple. Or in other cases, they might work with a different business to promote divestitures as a way of unlocking value. Aside from generating fees, is there a common thread that explains when and why acquisitions make sense versus going in the other direction and selling off assets? This is less, uh, less relevant in the middle market than um, the public markets because uh, you will see uh, uh, multiples assigned for different divisions um, based, on, um, based on cash flow. Uh, and, and so what you do is you sell off the less profitable um, divisions uh, uh, in terms of unlocking value and you, the price of your stock goes up because now you have cash flow that's generated um, uh, and uh, where it can be supported by a, a higher multiple. I'd like to comment on the, the, the middle market. Uh, once you hit a particular range, and I'm going to say $50 million in revenues, generally there are a lot of players in the, in the middle market. If you're at the $5 million revenue um, range, you have fewer um, players, uh, which means that um, uh, you can take advantage of it if you are a buyer uh, at the lower range, and you can take advantage of it at the higher range if you're, if you're a seller. Because if you have multiple buyers, um, uh, you uh, uh, can tend to get the best price out of, out of folks. When we sold Bread and Circus um, several years ago, uh, we provided the buyers with the uh, potential buyers with the same amount of information. We had offers between, and it, the, the Boston Globe um, uh, published these statistics, so it must be true. Uh, the ranges were 10 million to 29 and a half million. Same information. So it's, it, it, uh, it, it behooves you to, to be bigger, uh, to get to those um, higher levels to bring in more buyers if you're, if you're a seller. One of the questions was, is why do you divest? And um, I sold a couple things at IBM, and it's, not, it's a non-core asset. It's not a growth sector of the economy. It's not a growth sector for IBM. So it wants to get out of that business. Uh, uh, computer imaging was one of them. Uh, check processing and imaging, which was out of Tennessee. So we sold it to Platinum Equity and Doris Technology were the two bidders. They're two brothers out of Southern Cal and they're bottom fishers, but they've done a terrific job of buying assets from uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, the idea of, of growth, however, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the concern is, is the, you know, are the bankers trying to generate fees? In a sense, that's probably right, um, but in a, in a longer term sense, we like to have longer term relationships with our clients, and so we give them the best advice that we can. We look at the marketplaces, and if you're a big enough company that you ought to be acquiring, we think you ought to acquire. The companies right now, it's a great time to, to be in the acquisition uh, phase, but the, the end game is really what you ought to be focused on. Again, if you're a lifestyle company, like the lifestyle, don't go buy stuff, because it's tough to do, it's tough to make it work. If you've got an exit strategy that you want to generate, frankly, a lot of value for your company, right now the values in the marketplace are much higher for larger size companies than they are for smaller ones, the worlds of Instagram notwithstanding. There are people in this room to whom I've sent deals where people want to sell their companies and the bankers have said, no, you shouldn't, this is the wrong time or the wrong thing to do. Uh, the greater Boston market is a reasonably small market. People know each other and I think in the long run the investment bankers make their money through their reputation and their reputation isn't to churn stuff. I think a good investment banking group could, could, uh, is key to uh, doing a successful acquisition. Um, um, they, they, they help you look at it to make sure that you're, you're uh, properly um, um, valuing the business you're going to buy. They help you understand you know, how to put together the deal documents to make sure that what you're buying is, uh, is, is what you're getting. And if, you, if there is a, a dispute of some sort that there are representations and warranties made by the owners that are selling you to protect you and do those kinds of things. So, um, you know, it's definitely a, uh, it's worked well for me. Uh, in, in my, my, the acquisitions that I've done working with good investment banking firms.
to be very careful because as we've heard, often companies sell off their less profitable, profitable uh, operations. So you have to understand that they're selling it for the right reasons because they don't want it. And it's not a growth sector was one of the comments. So my point to you here is when you diversify, you need to be supremely careful with what you're doing because the people that are selling this to you have a great deal of experience in that industry uh, where you don't. So they're selling it for a really good reason. So the growth opportunity is probably to be slow and to be organic. Uh, what happens when you buy some of these less than profitable ventures is you get low ROI on your, on your existing business. As a package, low ROI, low ROI is not what you're looking for. So it, it's, that's why, in part, mergers and acquisitions have a very high failure rate because people are getting rid of the junk. Bankers are motivated uh, to obviously generate deal flow, as are all transactional professionals. But it doesn't necessarily impugn their motives, uh, ultimately, which is to create value for the client. So I agree with Stephen in terms of what he said there. But the other part about this, Jim, that I think is underestimated by especially privately held companies is that they don't realize how hard it is to manage what they acquire. Someone that founds a company and grows a company isn't necessarily a great manager of across the board of a growing enterprise that's diversified and growing in multiple disciplines. And uh, it takes a very unusual individual to be able to do that from start all the way through to exit. And Bob alluded to it in his business. He felt like he was holding his team back. And in fact, the data has shown that he was. Not everyone recognizes that or has the maturity to recognize that because it involves ego. So even though we talk about these theoretical things, there's the human element that can hold them back. And, and I think the inability to manage uh, at a growing enterprise level is something that's underestimated by uh, privately owned companies. We certainly hope that's the case. <laughs> uh, I think there's a, a tremendous amount of capital out there, uh, and the comments that I hear from uh, private equity groups, um, uh, senior lenders, mes the mezzanine folks is, there are a lot of businesses out there right now that are marginal. Um, many of the good businesses are holding back uh, because they want to return to 2007 days. Uh, but people do run out of time, and, and uh, we expect that the, uh, uh, the momentum that has been established will continue. I, I had uh, asked this very question of uh, a couple of directors of uh, public companies that were in acquisition mode. and. Uh, their view is that there is so much uh, uh, pent-up sale pressure that uh, uh, they continue to bottom fish, and that this is a substantial downward pressure on the uh, on, on the available multiples. And when I suggested that uh, statistics indicate that times have changed, their answer was, "Well, they may have changed for some people, but if you are disciplined on the acquisition side and stick to your guns, there's going there are going to be people who just have to bail." I have a brighter viewpoint. Uh, I think it's a great time to sell. Uh, I think there's so much money in private equity hands and in public company hands that they're bidding, they're bidding on quality properties and bidding the price up. Uh, so normal multiples were five to seven times uh, last 12 months EBITDA. We see them at six to eight and we see for some sectors it's even better. Right now my advice to healthcare information technology services companies uh, particularly the ones that do uh, implementation integration uh, for um, ambulatory and inpatient EMRs, electronic medical record companies, not a better time to sell than now because in a couple of years the era of high tech money is going to go away, the margin expansions you're currently experiencing are going to go away, and you're going to be left with execution risk. So right now I can sell you for 12 times EBITDA, in a couple of years that number is going to be back to 8. So you will, have, you will have had all the execution risk and you will get no value. So you're worth as much today as you're going to be worth in two years. So you want the execution risk? God bless you.